guys, this is for a microphone. Okay, so I've only tried to shoot this video about four different times, so hopefully this is going to work this time. And I just want to talk about uh, what I've been working on for the past couple months. Okay, so uh, after the Angorathon, this is basically what I have finished. And uh, this is all French, as far as I can remember. And this is Seymour. And then here is ah, Toby. And Titan. Okay, now in between what I was finishing for the Angorathon, because I still have Annabelle left, I decided to do a brief study. I went out to a fiber festival day at Lake Farm Park, which is a, a local farm park, of course, here. And I picked up this Hampshire. And so you can see the Hampshire breed study. I just posted it a few days ago. And uh, Hampshire was a new fiber for me, but the actual classification of the downbreeds is not new. I use downbreeds all the time. But what was new to me was the purple dye from Jacquard. And this brings up a really important point, is that sometimes new people to the craft, spinners, dyers, weavers, etc., are really gung-ho about making their products and then selling them. And which is great. I mean, go for it, make your products, sell them. But before you put something out in the market, you really should test run whatever it is you're putting out in order to make sure that it is going to be something that is quality. For example, uh, when you're, even when you're selling fleeces, you want to process your fleece, whether you're processing commercially or yourself, if you don't have a spinner available, try to get the um, experience of a spinner to see if the fleece that you are producing and the way that it's shorn or that it's cared for is going to be a product that a spinner can actually use. Because I've gotten fleeces or products made from fleeces where uh, the grower wasn't really sure about the quality of the fleece, so maybe um, the fleece didn't turn out right, it had too many breaks, or it was just had a lot of VM in it, it was handled wrong, it was shorn with too many second cuts, it was sent to the mill with a lot of VM, and it came back with a lot of VM. And so that lack of experience uh, produced a product that was not very good quality and sometimes unusable, but the girl didn't know that because they didn't, you know, kind of check these things out prior to. It's kind of like, oh, I've got this fleece and I'm going to sell it. Well, no, you really want to, you know, do some product research and testing before you put it out there on the market. Okay, it's the same with dyers. Uh, whatever prep you're using, uh, you want to make sure that the color doesn't bleed. You want to make sure that those colors, when they're spun together, are not going to turn into something that is a muddy mess. You want to make sure that um, eventually that the product is going to wear well and those colors are not going to fade out. You know, nobody wants to have this awesome colorway and after you use the scarf, the shawl, the mitts or whatever for a couple months, all the colors fade or the colors bleed or any of that kind of stuff. Or if you're a hand spinner, you want to make sure that um, whatever you did when you spun it doesn't result in fibers that uh, lose their integrity, that they lose their shape, or that they don't uh, peel excessively. Because I know there are people who are like, oh, I'll just cart it up, comb it up, the neps add character. Sometimes neps add character. Sometimes neps cause peeling in your yarns. Or if you're using um, a yarn or fiber, you want to make sure it's strong enough. So you might spin up something and it may not be appropriate for weaving uh, or it may not, uh, it just may not be useful 
as a final product. So when you dye your stuff, spin it, see how it looks, sample it, swatch it, use it. Make sure it's not going to fall apart on somebody or going to peel or bleed or excessive pulling. Uh, your hand spun yarns, make sure they're strong enough to do whatever it is that you say they're going to do. Um, if you say you're going to be able to weave with them, you want to know this. I weave with my own fibers, so I know they're strong enough for weaving. I Everything I make basically is my own hand prep, so I know the prep is going to be good. I know that the spin is good. I've had these things for several years. I know what colors are going to bleed or fade. I actively avoid those kind of things. Um, I know the colorways I've been using for the past couple of years. I know how they're going to look. So this is something you want to do before you sell things. And so that leads me to where I'm going with this group of yarns I have right here, which I'm talking about swatching. Now, as I was saying that you want to test out the things. And in this case, I am using a dye color that I had not used before, and that is the Jacquard Purple. Believe it or not, the purple is new to me. And most of the things I've been dying purple is either from the periwinkle, and that's where I'm getting a lot of my purples from, from the iris breaking the periwinkle. And so I needed some true purple, good true purple, and decided to work on that now. I crock pot dye almost all the time because it's just really convenient for me. It's much easier than trying to lay out uh, yarn or fiber or anything in paint. I just didn't really have that kind of space. And so Laura from Laughing Cat Fibers found a roaster for me. And so you want to know how much difference a roaster makes from a crock pot. Well, it depends on your crock pot and the roaster, but it was a big difference for me. The crock pot takes longer to heat up and it has less space, of course. And also um, it's... Uh, is way hotter. I think the maximum for the crock pot was probably 180 degrees Fahrenheit. And I'm not even sure if it really got that hot, but it never boiled and it just barely simmered. And so it was just hot enough to make the dye strike. And if I'm putting dye in a pot that's cold and waiting a half an hour for this dye to, to uptake, then I'm getting a a lot different striking than I am putting it in the pot and in five minutes and it heats up to 200 degrees. So when I first did the Jacquard purple dye, uh, I had a hard time really getting a really nice solid purple inside the crock pot because it just wouldn't strike at that temperature. So I wanted something that didn't really break and was really muted and it wasn't what I liked. And so I was not real happy about this yarn when I first spun it up. And it really, it wasn't until I swatched that I really began to appreciate it. And honestly, I only swatched uh, this one because I was explaining to someone about how they really need to test their yarns. And so I was like, well, I'm saying this, and it has been a long time since I swatched because I've been dying with the same colors forever. I need to go back and take my own advice for all this new stuff. And so that's what happened with the Hampshire. So after the Hampshire, I dyed this Irish skein right here. And this one took me to my paces because the first time I dyed it, it was in the crock pot and it wasn't a lot of space. And this is, a, this is not a lot of yardage, it's like 330 yards, but it's a worsted weight. And so it kind of took up the whole pot. And I didn't really get the coverage I was looking for and so, like I said, the purple inside the crock did not dye very deeply. So that's where you get all the light purple from, which is a color I really like, but I really wanted something dark. So I put it in the roaster, which got really hot really fast, and the color struck really nice, and I got a really deep purple from that. I dyed it more than once. And here's the swatch, which I think turned out wonderful with really happy about that swatch. So the new colorways I'm working with are the Tiger Lilies. Oh, before I show you the Tiger Lily, let me show you this thing right here. And uh, 
I was supposed to be dying Tiger Lily. And I don't know what happened. I had an orange. I had the yellow. Uh, it was great. And then I just kind of put the purple in. And it wasn't Tiger Lily anymore. And I was like, gosh, that's an iris now. So I put a little blue, blue in. And uh, this is kind of how it turned out. <laughs> so much for not dying irises. It's more like a, uh, a bird of paradise now. I was very heavy with the orange, like very, very heavy. And you can see how being heavier with the orange uh, completely changes the skin. If it had been a little less orange and a little less yellow, they would have been closer to each other like an iris, but I got really heavy with that. Okay, now, so anyway, on to the tiger lilies. These are the tiger lilies. And this was the first one. And I've been trying to work on my speckling technique, um, which is more complicated for me because it's a low immersion and I'm kind of used to filling the pot and painting things on letting it swirl like a watercolor pan. So I wind up with some really big blotches of dark color, which I didn't immediately like. It looked kind of muddy to me here. Just kind of like an oops. But on Laura's advice, I stained it again and found that I really liked it much better that way. And you can see how this turns out. The big thing for me is learning how to put the um, spots, dark spots here, in a, such a way that they're far enough apart in different places. And pulling is really something that's hard to avoid completely. But there are some things you can do when it comes to varying the lengths of the color splotches. And um, when you have big color changes, like between the light orange and this kind of brownish black, you just have to be careful with it those big tonal changes. But that worked, that one worked out fine. So that's the tiger lily right there. And this one is the second tiger lily. And it's, well, what happened with this one is I just wanted some red flex in it. And uh, I got a little heavy with the red. And I put in extra vinegar when I went to make the darker red which raised the level of my water. So I got more red in a wider area than I had intended. And that's where I went wrong with this one. Though, I mean, it's really not going wrong. It actually really went right, but it doesn't match the previous Tiger Lily. So pretty much they're Tiger Lily 1 and Tiger Lily 2. I like them both equally. And uh, it is hard to repeat colors if you're not you know, doing big batches at one time, you know. Especially if you are treating kind of like paintings, because you're like a little dab here, a little dab there, next thing you know, you're like, oops, that's not the same. All right, now these two are stargazer lilies. And all three of these are dyed with the same red. They really are. Uh, this was the first one. And for the tiger lilies, I used uh, a brown. And this one I used jacquard black to make the, the dark specks for the lily. For this one, these two right here, I used the purple to make the dark specks. And you can see where I was heavier with the purple here, and it changed that red, bright red, into more of a, um, I don't know what I want to call that. It's like a red violet and a little bit of kind of like a maybe fuchsia color for this one. On this one right here, I used considerably less purple to darken the splotches. The splotches are smaller, and so I have a brighter red and a very nice hot pink that goes through here. So the difference between these two is the amount of purple I used as the dark splotches. So here's this one. And as you can see, the spaces, the dark splotches are a lot smaller. My flecking has got a lot better for those little spots. And then this one, they are a lot bigger. And there's a little pulling on the side right here. But I think with a bigger swatch, 
I would be more comfortable with it. Like if this was a sock, these small amount of rows um, would you know, probably cause more pulling, but if you're making a shawl, you know, you, you've got 50, 60 stitches on the needle, you're going to space that out a lot differently. It'll look different. Okay, so that's pretty much where I'm at. It's going to be a lot of lilies. Uh, there are quite a few varieties of lilies to go through, and I'm just going to try to you know, different kinds of lilies. Uh, inevitably, the irises will appear again because they are, of course, my uh, all-time favorite like, obsession. Purples and blues and some yellow flag irises. Uh, okay, so anyway, that's where I'm at. Um, thank you for watching this video. Um, I appreciate basically anybody who bothers to watch these videos. As always, if you have any questions or comments or you just want to chat, go ahead and leave a little something down in the comment section. I'd be more than happy to help you. If there's anything in particular you'd like me to answer um, through the comments or by video, let me know. And I'd be happy to make a video about it. Uh, click the like button if you can and subscribe if you haven't already. Share it with your friends. I appreciate that. You can also see me on the other social medias uh, through the different Facebook groups or on Instagram. And hopefully, uh, in the next few weeks, I'll have the Bond Breed Study and the Gulf Coast Native Breed Study uh, uploaded and available. Okay, thanks a lot, everybody. Have a great day.